Hello. In previous exercises, we have learned to estimate probability mass functions by calculating histograms. In this video, we are thus going to learn how we can estimate probability density functions by repeatedly sampling a continuous random variable. There is an immediate problem in doing so. Suppose that we calculate the probability density function for the uniform continuous random variable that lies between A and B, and this is generated by using the command shown at the top of this slide. We see an immediate problem. The random variable can take any real value in this range. There are an infinite number of real numbers in this range, however. Consequently, if we were to count how often each random variable came up, as we did when we were computing histograms for discrete random variables, we would end up with a distribution that had delta functions centred on each of our sample variables, something like this. We would not see any real number come up more than once, and worse still, we would need to have an infinitely long array in order to count how often each of the real numbers appeared in our sample. To resolve this problem and to make the problem tractable, tractable we have to use regularization. There are various ways of regularizing the problem and, contrary to what the word regularization would seem to suggest, this is not particularly complicated. As you will see, I am using the word regularization to describe something very simple, mainly so that you can drop this long and complicated sounding word into conversations to sound very intelligent. You are welcome. So how do we regularize the problem here? Well, we divide our range up into a discrete number of intervals, and we count how many of the samples are in each of these discrete ranges. For the example shown here, in this second bin, we thus have two samples. In this fourth bin, we have one sample. There is one further sample in this fifth bin, one sample in this sixth bin, and one sample in the eighth bin. See, I told you, regularization is not that hard. In fact, we've already seen how to do this. This is the same code that we used to write a program to generate a discrete uniform random variable. To be clear though, let's see how a computer program that does this sort of calculation of estimating a probability density function works in practice. Here is the full code to calculate and plot an estimate of the probability density function by sampling a continuous random variable multiple times. Let's not panic and try to understand it all at once, but let's instead go through this piece by piece. To begin, let's focus on what these lines are doing. The first line here sets the maximum and minimum values that our random variable takes. As for discrete random variables, we sometimes have to truncate this range as some of the continuous random variables we encounter have infinite support. As we saw for discrete random variables, however, we are fine as long as we do not set this range to be stupidly small. What we are in essence guaranteeing by setting x min and x max here is that our random variable will fall into the range shown in the diagram here. If the random variable has a mixed maximum and minimum value, then this range is easy to set. If it has infinite support, it is then usually easy to determine a range that the random variable will fall into most of the time. Once we have defined this range, we can safely divide it into n bins, disjoint segments or bins. In the code, we divide the range from x min to x max into 20 such bins. In the diagram, however, we will keep things simpler by just dividing this range into four.
Let's now turn to the second line of the code. This line creates an empty list that will ultimately contain the X coordinates for each of our bins. We will thus come back to this momentarily. What we want to focus here on the, is the meaning of the variable del X. This quantity is calculated by taking X max divided by X min and dividing this difference by the number of bins. Del X is thus the width of each of the bins as shown in the diagram. Let's now come back to setting of the X values for the positions of the bars, the quantity in the list X bins. The values of the elements in this list are set using the for loop here. If you look at this loop, and think about what it is doing for a moment, you should be able to see that it is setting the elements of the list so that each one takes a value that is at the centre of each of the bins, as shown in the diagram on the right-hand side. We are thus going to assume that we can calculate an estimate for the probability density function at each of the midpoints of the bins by calculating the frequency with which our random variable falls within each of the bins. Now that we have set up the list with the X coordinates for our estimate of the probability density function, let's turn to how the Y coordinates are set. The Y values that are plotted are set in the lines of code shown here. Most of this code should be reasonably familiar as it is just generating a set of samples of the random variable. There are two key lines in the code here. The first of these generates our continuous random variables, and the second counts how many of the random variables falls within each of the bins. We can illustrate how these two lines of code are able to do this diagrammatically as shown in the right of the slide now. The first line generates a random variable that will lie in somewhere in the range between x min and x max. Let's say that the value of the random variable is here. The second line, the one with the np floor command, then transforms rand so that bin has a value which if it is multiplied by del x and added to x min, would fall here. Let's think about this step another way because it is the hardest step in the whole procedure. Let's suppose that our range between x min and x max here is just slightly to the right of the origin at x equals naught. Subtracting x min from the random variable that we generate essentially ensures that the value we get out will, between, be, will be between 0 and x max minus x min, as shown here. Now let's consider what happens when we divide by del x. Del x, remember, is equal to the width of each of the bin. Consequently, when we divide the number by del x, we turn that a number that is between 0 and x max, minus x min, to a number between 0 and n bins, as shown here. Let's now turn to the final piece of the puzzle, the np floor function. When we take the floor of a real number, we essentially take the real number and chop off all the numbers that appear after the decimal place in order to get an integer. In other words, we round the number down. The net result of the line involving the NP floor function is thus that you generate, if you generate a real value that appears in the first bin, you get bin equals zero. If you, your random variable is in the second bin, you get bin equals 1. If your random variable is in the third bin, you get bin equals 2, and so on. 
we can thus use the value of bin that we get out from these two lines of code to decide what element of the list that counts each time one of the bin ranges appears. We count which, which element of this list needs to be incremented by one as shown on the line in the code after the one that computes bin. One final thing on this code. Notice that I have used the int function here to convert the output from the np floor command into an integer. This is really important as we need the an integer in order to refer to an element of the array. In this code, this conversion is essential. If you do not include that int, the code will error. The last parts of the code are then very simple and very similar to what we do when we calculated histograms for discrete random variables. In essence, we normalize the distribution, which involves dividing each element of y valves by the number of samples we generate, and we then plot the data. The only slight difference is that we also need to divide each element of y valves by the width of the bin as well as by the number of samples. This division ensures that the integral, i.e. the area under the curve, is equal to 1. And as we know, any probability density function must have an integral over all space that is equal to 1. The final result of the code is shown here. To be clear, I would always use a line rather than a bar chart to represent an estimate of a probability density function. By using a line, we indicate that the object we are estimating here is supposed to be a continuous function. I hope that is reasonably clear. Try to complete the exercise that follows yourself and to generate an estimate for a probability density function. Good luck and thanks for your attention.